our next, uh, our next ta uh, talk is actually the Central Bankers Panel. Um, with, if, the, if the panel would like to make their way up, with uh, Rob Ali at the DCI, Sonia, David uh, Sonia Davidovic at IMF, Bob K. Bench with the Boston Federal Reserve, uh, moderated by Michael Kurt, Tech Review. Thanks, thanks for sticking around, <clears throat> excuse me, until the last panel. My name is Mike Orcutt. I'm a reporter for <coughs> MIT Technology Review, and I'll be the moderator, <clears throat> excuse me, for this discussion. We're gonna delve into, we're gonna switch gears a little bit and delve into um, the topic, um, which has been picking up a lot of steam lately, of central bank digital currencies. Um, and we have some very knowledgeable panelists um, to my right and on the screen. And to, so to kick it off, I'm just gonna have them um, introduce themselves and explain um, what they focus on in their work. Sure, so uh, I'm Rob Ali. I'm a research scientist at the DCI and I focus on central bank digital currency. Before I joined the DCI in 2016, I worked at the Bank of England um, from 2011 to 2016 and worked on central bank digital currency there. Uh, I'm Bob Bench. I uh, am the director of the Applied FinTech Research Division at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Our goal is to understand what technologies can be uh, leveraged to advance the mission of the Federal Reserve, as well as understand any technologies uh, that can uh, cause a threat to the mission of the Federal Reserve. So I'm Sonia Davidovich. I'm an economist and digital expert with the International Monetary Fund. I'm part of a working group on uh, operationalizing central bank digital currencies, really lo looking at the nitty gritty of how to actually implement a CBDC on the, at the retail level. And I'm also part of the digital advisory unit that is helping our member countries navigate issues of the of digitalization of digital economy in general. Cool, thank you. So there's been a distinct change of late in this discussion, um, potentially maybe catalyzed by the, the proposal by Facebook um, that has run into some resistance. But then after that, uh, the Chinese central bank has become very vocal on this topic and it, it's widely expected that that bank will issue its own digital currency this year. In addition to that, there are a number of other banks around the world that seem to be seriously moving down this road. So the discussion has changed from sort of high level talk about the pros and cons of central bank digital currencies to the question of how exactly should central banks implement <coughs> digital currencies. Um, so we're gonna delve into some of the sort of more practical design considerations um, in this discussion. And we'll, we'll explore some of the implications of those potential decisions, um, sort of how they might change the financial system and change the world uh, more broadly. Uh, I'm gonna start with a question for that's gonna start off with Rob, but if the other panelists wanna jump in after he uh, answers, um, that'd be great. Um, people ask this all the time, sort of snarkily um, on Twitter, and I've heard a lot of people say this, but basically it boils down to, isn't the dollar already digital? Isn't, don't, isn't currency already digital? Don't we, like, I rarely carry cash around. Um, what exactly are we talking about when it comes to, to central bank digital currency? Yeah, I mean, that's true. I mean, the same could be said of Bitcoin, right? I mean, Bitcoin's digital, so you could say, well, money's already digital, so it didn't add anything. But I think that um, the thing about Bitcoin is that it's structurally different from money in a bank account. It, you know, if you go back to the white paper, it talks about um, being able to make payments without financial institutions. And I think that uh, central bank digital currency, whilst different from Bitcoin, is similar in the sense of it would be structurally different and it would allow a different institutional structure around it. And I think, to me, when I first saw it, one of the attractions, because before working at the Bank of England, I was actually at the competition agency in the UK. 
And I think one of the um, attractions for me was it, it carries the potential, central bank digital currency carries the potential for a much more competitive and efficient financial system um, in addition to benefits around security. Uh, so I think that, yes, it's digital, and yes, the dollar's already digital, but I think if you can change the interest or any currency is already digital, uh, if you can change the institutional structure around money and change the sort of base layer, then it, I think that's one of the ways in which you can really alter the financial system or improve its efficiency, um, improve its competitiveness. And I think that's something that post-crisis is really necessary. I mean, after the crisis, it was all really about stabilization. I think now we should be in the wave of looking at, okay, how can we really um, get the real benefits of, of um, digitization that haven't really borne fruit to date in the financial system? Um, but either Bob or Sonia, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, sure. I think um, a lot of people underestimate that, or we kind of assume that we have all these means of payment, including like what have you, credit cards, Venmo, PayPal, or you know any form of crypto assets, cryptocurrencies. But a lot of people in this world do not have access to uh, those means of payments. They're not banks. In some instances, they do not have a, a proper institution that will enable them to have access to financial services and products. So they can't really participate in the uh, in the economy the way that, that we all do without even thinking about it, right? So I think that is one of the most compelling uh, motivations for issuing CBDC, the financial inclusion aspect, because it's providing this ubiquitous ac access to finance it's something that policymakers and central banks are surely interested in, um, and the, the, commercial, the commercial aspect is, would be less pronounced than for a, um, let's say, private sector payment system provider or uh, general asset provider. Like the, you know, it's mortar and brick um, buildings or institutions that don't need to be built lots of savings that can be made. Depending on the infrastructure, it may not be commercially viable for pri private payment system providers to offer their services and products in remote areas and areas that are not part of the grid. And so this is um, an important aspect that the central bankers have been trying to solve through the use of a retail CDC. And the other thing that I wanted to mention, uh, yes, we have a digital form of, of a dollar already, but does it, is it efficient, especially in in like the cross border aspect? I mean, I would say not not really, right? It's it's yes, it works. You can wire money to anywhere in the world if assuming those people or the recipients are banks. But how much time does it take, right? Like a week, ten days, and how much does it cost, right? And so there are a lot of uh, a lot of these issues that a central bank digital currency can potentially solve without necessarily having you know, this commercial viability um, aspect uh, and, um, and as an important part of their considerations and um, the competition, competitive aspect I mentioned earlier as well. Thank you. Uh, Bob, anything to add? Yeah, I think, um, you know, to Rob's point, for most retail customers, it's digital, right? The, the dollar is digital. Um, but I think, you know, this is, the, this is a BT, an expo at BTC, Right. So, but since BTC, we haven't really had a breakdown in the markets. Uh, it's been the longest economic expansion, and things are changing now. Um, but I hope that you know, if, if the expansion stops, it's not because of a virus. I, that's that would be a, that'd be terrifying. Um, but you know, when when things do break down, really important things start happening. Questions such as counterparty risk, right? Uh, entity viability, the role of intermediaries, they become really important. Uh, and so. I do disagree in part with Rob in that, you know, commercial, your, your digital accounts at your commercial bank, for most people, function as money until things get really bad, right? And commercial banks start struggling or have crisis. And then what you have is commercial paper that the FDIC may give you a backing for, um, but becomes a, uh, something that the FDIC has to get involved in, isn't actually directly a central bank reserve. Um, so currently, you know, we really don't have digital central bank reserves with the possible exception of Alipay and WeChat, which since June of last year became directly funded by the PBOC and were directly held at the PBOC. So one could make an argument that that was the largest central bank digital currency project to date. Um, 
But you know, when we talk about CBDCs, we're really talking about a direct claim on the central bank itself, um, which does not pass through the counterparty risk of a commercial banking entity or, inter or intermediary. And that's something that, at least on the US side, has massive policy implications on both directions uh, that we still have to do a lot of hard thinking about to understand more fully of what does it mean if the central bank has a direct, if you have a direct claim on the central bank, how we operate it, uh, what happens to banks. Uh, these are all critical issues that a lot of very smart people at the Fed and other central banks are thinking about. Um, and we still have a lot of learning to do from people like Rob and folks like Neha and people like you know, Gary Gensler here at MIT that can help us along that path. Interesting, thank you. Um, this one, I'm going to start with Sonia. Again, <clears throat> if you two want to jump in after she answers. The, the IMF, I think, has counted, I mean, you, China, like we said, is sort of the, the poster child of this and is, is definitely, seems to be out in the lead, but um, there are a lot of other countries that are, appear to be growing quite serious about issuing central bank digital currencies. You know, the IMF and Sonia have looked into that um, and I think counted, at, like, I'm going to say tens of central banks are at least exploring exploring this. The question for me, um, for Sonia, to ask Sonia is sort of why are they doing this and how does the why vary um, from bank to bank? What are, what, are, what are the rationales? What's the point of even doing this? Sure. Um, I think it really um, all depends and it's country specific. I mentioned the um, financial inclusive, inclusion legislation, which I think is the most powerful one um, that we have seen in terms of like a, a use case, um, then there's certainly aspects like the dwindling use of cash, which uh, countries like Sweden like, are experiencing. And I want to say uh, we can add a lot more countries to that list uh, in the in the medium term. And then um, Uruguay, for example, had next to financial inclusion the interest in um, reducing, oper uh, increasing operational efficiency and reducing the cost of handling cash. I mean, it's expensive to be hauling cash around, the printing and all of that. I think they've calculated like about almost like a 1% of the GDP was um, the cost involved in that. So those are some of the aspects that we see. And then one of them that I touched upon earlier was also reducing potential monopoly distortions or any market distortions that might arise from like private payment system providers, which I think is an important aspect. And this is where Libra kind of hit the nerve with a lot of central bankers because the network effects are huge. And um, it's simply not something that um, central bankers were necessarily uh, happy about. So, um, and interestingly enough, now with the coronavirus, I actually, um, the Fed's like quarantine cash, US dollar bills coming from Asia for up to 10 days. So one could argue, that, that that is an additional motivation to uh, go digital and issue a CBDC because you wouldn't have the contamination of uh, notes and bills that are in circulation in unaffected areas. I mean, this is just a side note given that it's a hot topic at the moment, but um, those are sort of the use cases that we're seeing um, across the globe. Just to follow up, that Sonia. That is just for the retail. That's just for the retail. I'm not talking about retail CBDC. The whole area of wholesale CBDC is um, is a separate topic, and I want to just point out one thing, and that is, it's not just like I think people started paying attention to it, uh, to it only like most recently because of Libra, but Rob will know that the Bank of England has been conducting research in this area since 2015. I think they were like the first central bank to start exploring this topic, and many other central banks have been looking into it for for years now. It only hasn't been so much on the public radar. Um, that came only most recently with Libra. Are there any, <clears throat> to all three of you, are there any, besides China and Sweden, are there any particular, particularly compelling um, cases around the world where they, they, particularly interesting for any reason, whether it be um, sort of the, the approach or, or the rationale behind the approach, um, where Specifically, if, if I want to talk about where the rubber is meeting the road here, um, besides the China and Sweden. I mean, I think one, I think for any any central bank or treasury seriously looking at CBC, you really need to look at your own 
customer. So and think of your customer as the user of your currency, the citizens of your country. And you really need to tailor it to your country and to your use case. So Sweden's going to have a very different use case than China. Um, Indonesia, which is a collection of thousands of islands, is going to have a very different use case to Poland, which is a landlocked country. Um, so the, you know, one of the classic use case-based examples is Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. right? So the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank covers several dozen islands um, that, aside from certain highly wealthy persons, is fairly impoverished. Um, and families are scattered across these multiple dozen islands, and it costs $100 to move cash from island to island. So adding a $100 remittance fee, um, a flat fee, no matter what, how much cash you're moving, to an, a collection of impoverished countries, you need a use case that works for you. Um, so this may not be a use case that requires high throughput, you know, visa-like throughput at 24,000 transactions a second, or what uh, the PBOC is gunning for, which is 300 transactions, 200,000 transactions a second. They just need it to be faster than the boat it takes or the plane it takes to fly from island to island. So what the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank did is they looked at their customer, their customer people who did occasional cash transactions to family and friends that cost a $100 flat fee. And so they built a system that I walked through them with them recently that works. Uh, it's slow, you know, uh, but it works and it saves you um, over 99% um, fee, a fee saving of over 99%. Uh, that's a great use case that is critical for that country. The technology is there to support it, and it's going to have massive savings for people who need it the most. Um, there's a multitude of examples yeah. like that, but that's a great example of technologists mm -hmm. and policymakers coming together to understand the needs of their consumer and really taking a product focus on this, right? What does the product user want and building to that purpose? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, it varies pretty widely from country to country, the motivation. I mean, some talk about, so Sweden's talked about it, Canada's talked about the potential decline of cash and you know, what's the effect of that and does the central bank, has an obli does the central bank have an obligation to provide risk-free money to the public rather than just to other banks? Um, and then they, you know, for, when I was in the UK, there was thinking about how is the financial system going to change? So London's obviously a highly developed financial market and thinking about, well, how is technology going to change this market? The central banks, I think, are unique amongst sort of regulatory type bodies because they're both regulators of the system and participants in the system and have, have always been. So they can't really stand aside from the financial system and say, well, you know, the financial system is changing and we can sort of stand apart from it because there's derivatives dealing or whatever in, in other, the Bank of England's trading desk. So they have to participate in the market. So they're going to be, if the markets shift to something else, then they have to be ready to sort of move with that. And it, there's this continual challenge for central banks to sort of reinvent themselves as the financial system changes. So they can't really stand apart from it and say, well, you know, um, we don't, you know, we're not affected by the demand. And I think that it, certainly in the UK, we saw this demand for, and you see it with these sort of stable coins saying, well, we want this, we, you know, we want something close as possible to risk-free money. But a lot of people would come to us and say, we'd rather the central bank just did it. That would make our lives much simpler. All right. So this, this question is for all three of the panelists. So whoever wants to jump in first um, can go ahead and do that. Um, one big question, and we're at a Bitcoin conference. So, I mean, this is, this is a very important question. Um, that central bankers will need to answer is whether or not they'll use a distributed ledger or something that is like a blockchain <clears throat> system, um, or whether they should turn to a, a, a more traditional looking centralized system. Um, that's like a, a, a really big question, but I'm wondering if the panelists can, can sort of walk us through the considerations um, behind that question um, and, and sort of the, the potential upsides, potential downsides of using a decentralized system versus a centralized one? Um, I think you're likely to end up with something like a hybrid in the end. And also, I don't think every central bank will choose the same system, right? In the same way that I'm sure every central bank doesn't run the same database software. But I think like how they interact with each other is going to be key. So you can sort of knit it all together into a single system. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that there are certain elements of Bitcoin. I mean, Bitcoin's shown itself to be resilient over time. You know, it's a system that exists in a very hostile environment, and it's proved resilient to that. And I think that's something that is security being a main, you know, major consideration for central banks. That's something that's attractive, and it's a different way of achieving security um, rather than trying to hide the sort of data behind walls. It's like trying to make the system so it's inherently resilient. 
Uh, and then privacy is another one. I, I think certainly uh, when I was at the Bank of England, there was no desire whatsoever to hold individual accounts that the central bank could scrutinize what was going on. So I think, again, Bitcoin gives you a, it shows you a method and others, other cryptocurrencies show you a method of essentially having anonymity in the core system, but then you know, having allowing people to use wallets at the, at the perimeter. So I think there's certainly a lot you can learn from um, cryptocurrencies, but I doubt, and it will vary how they, you know, from central bank to central bank, how they implement it. Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, it's not gonna be a straight copy of a cryptocurrency for sure. So I think I personally think that the choice of technology should come last in the whole decision making process because what we've seen a lot is that there's um, a hype out there and that people are quickly jumping to choosing the technology just because it's it's popular and people are talking about it. They hyped it up. So um, that certainly happened with uh, blockchain, and then the result of that is that we've seen central banks that are directly uh, engaging a vendor without going through uh, the proper process of testing a technology in a proof of concept, selecting a vendor in, uh, through an open bidding process and uh, a request for a proposal. So and it's th that is something that, that might be a big problem, especially for central banks and lack the capacity to perhaps evaluate uh, technologies or vendors properly. And the other thing is that I want to say is it's really important to nail down the use case. What are the pain points and what is the policy objective that you're trying to pursue? And that should dictate what technology you end up choosing. I know that we're in a Bitcoin expo and yes, of course, there's a lot of promises that a DLT can offer, right? Like you can, you could, for example, a pro would be, you could program the central bank digital currency to perform specific functions. You, will, you could build uh, intelligence tools on top of it that will give you a better picture of you know, how CBDC transactions are um, happening in your economy and like will help you with supervision. Uh, but like we haven't like really seen yet how privacy can be properly protected. And I think that's something that came out in a lot of the um, proof of concept that central banks did. I think most recently Stella alluded to the fact that privacy preserving and, and Brazil too and their salt. POC, that privacy is certainly an area where they've seen weaknesses. Interoperability is another one, right? Like, how can we interoperate not only between different DLT networks, but also between DLT enabled networks and uh, DLT net networks and legacy systems, right? And we can't expect everyone to just, as Rob was saying, everyone to just use the same platform or the same network and, you know, just uh, ignore everything else that they have like the, the existing databases or platforms they're running on, there are TGS, for example, or there are their other payment systems. So I do think that um, we need to do a lot more work before we can actually say, yes, you know, this is the way to go and there's no other way. In fact, there are some central banks that have been um, using uh, technologies other than DLT for their um, POC. One of them is Uruguay, for example, a lot of people don't know that, but certainly, um, worth exploring and I think it's central banks around the world are doing most of them are doing the right thing by testing it out in pilots testing it out and um, testing the concepts out in a limited scale yeah um, I think to Rob's point I think you you can learn a lot at least starting with BTC right you can learn a lot from BTC um, one from, you know, Rob and I have discussed this in the past, as I've had with Sonia, is that, you know, if you were to do the top 10 requirements, right, if you're doing a PRD for a US CBDC, the top, of the top 10 requirements, the first nine are security, right? Uh, because the second that thing goes live, it's the most attack program in the world. Um, and BTC has shown some resiliency there, right? I mean, it's effectively a $170 billion bug bounty that's out there for anyone can, who wants to grab it, and no one's grabbed it yet. That's pretty interesting from a security standpoint. Um, but again, going back to my earlier statements, you need to understand the use case, right? So BTC is really interesting because it's mostly just transactional values. Um, but if you're trying to build a, a retail central bank digital currency, you know, if, you're, if you're China, for example, you know, there was 40 trillion in volume last year between Alipay and WeChat alone, right? Um, so what you need something you can do is over and over and over and over again, move value and do it quickly without breaking, right? The best example is, this is my iPhone 10, right? It lasted about five minutes with my 18-month-old before it broke, right? I could hammer in a nail on this table with my iPhone 10, 
but it would break after about the third nail. But the right hammer could do that over and over and over and over again. And that's the kind of platform you're going to need for a retail central bank currency. Is, and this is one thing I'm, I'm, you know, on the technology side of the Fed, we're always cautious when someone comes with a, with a, with a blockchain solution or DLT solution that was built to do complex computing that might not have been built to move value, right? And sometimes people are, there's hammers looking for nails out there. And I think any, any central bank, if they're looking down this path, whether wholesale or retail, they really need to understand the use case and understand the platform is built for that use case. You can't just take something that's turned complete out of a box and say, this is good for moving value, right? That might not be the right idea. Um, and I think central banks are being very thoughtful about this, of what can do the action that's required to do consistently, highly securely, uh, with sufficient speed for the user in mind. Um, and you can't take a blockchain off a, you know, off a shelf and say, all right, this works. And it might work, but what happens when you get to the $10 trillion volume or the $30 trillion volume? Things start falling off the shelf. Pieces start falling off. The iPhone starts breaking. Um, and that's something we, any central bank who is thinking about putting the full faith and trust of their government's currency behind the platform, they really need to understand that thing's secure and it's going to work over and over and over again. So I want to get a little bit more into detail, uh, in the details of the, the discussion about security um, in this context. Starting with, I'm going to start with Rob again. Um, I know that you see security related concerns as sort of paramount. Um, and I was wondering if you could sort of give us an like, intellectual framework for thinking about this. Um, what, are, what are the most important questions that central bankers should be asking in the area of security if they're serious about going down this road? Sure. I, I think the, the way I think about it is in terms of generations of software, right, and what's been added between generations. And I think that um, if you think about Bitcoin, now I know there was like um, other quasi-cryptocurrencies, so um, Charmian Charm and eCash and so forth, before Bitcoin. But let's take Bitcoin for argument's sake as the start of this generation of cryptocurrencies. So, so we say Bitcoin's the first generation, it had Bitcoin script, which is relatively simple, not Turing complete, has been relatively secure over time. And then, you know, the sort of second wave, second generation came along, Ethereum and others, and they said, okay, we want this Turing complete scripting language in there. Um, and I think that there is a sort of implicit assumption that, let's say, and let's say central bank digital currency is in the third generation because it hasn't really been deployed yet. I think, and I've read a lot of like, papers that sort of say, well, we need to make it more complicated. You know, we need something even more complex than Ethereum or even more complex than Solidity. And I'm like, well, given that the attack surface increases with complexity, why would you continue to increase the complexity with every generation? Because you just make it more and more impossible to manage the security. So I think that, in fact, what you want in the third generation is a much simpler system um, even than Bitcoin itself, I think you can simplify Bitcoin greatly. I mean, I've spoken to some of the Bitcoin developers, and I think, you know, they were saying if we were writing Bitcoin again from scratch, we would take, you know, it's more about taking things away than adding things, and I think that's the, in terms of making it secure, I think that should be the mindset, is like, what can we subtract, and how can we make this simpler? And then you get closer to Bob's um, vision of a very, very secure, very fast system, rather than an incredibly complicated system with a very big attack surface. Either Bob or Sonia have anything to add? Yeah, sure. I mean, what we observe a lot is that central banks, because of um, the maybe the lack of capacity or the inability to properly assess their cybersecurity um, uh, requirements, they will outsource this to um, commercial vendors, to third parties. And that is, I, I think, um, a very... Um, Sure, it does help, yeah, if you lack the capa in house capacity, but it's, a, it's dangerous in terms of like a central bank not being um, or shouldn't like can be absolved from the responsibility that comes with ensuring like robust cyber resilience. And the other thing that people I think oftentimes underestimate is that cybersecurity is like a multifaceted. Um, requires a multifaceted approach. It's about people, it's about processes, it's about the, your weakest link and all of that. And, and I think that people underestimate that because you could have like, um, you could have the securest system if your people that are operating that system, um, you know, click on a phishing email or are, you know, do whatever, uh, 
and allow or enable a security breach, your best, most robust system is not going to help you with uh, providing that cybersecurity. So I think this cybersecurity risk management framework is super important. They're looking at all the all the components that might, are entailed uh, are part of that, including um, your internal processes and uh, uh, the people. Like, and it's really about making sure that your weakest link in that whole uh, setup is um, properly um, covered and that you have a, an adequate risk medication uh, and recovery plan in, in place. Yeah, I mean, so with regards to security, I think you have to look at the use cases, right? So for uh, those who look into the wholesale CBDC side, you're dealing with a very small number of participants uh, in a closed loop network. And so security really is less about the protocol than the endpoints, right? Uh, the classic example is, um, you know, the, the Bangladesh issue that happened uh, several years ago with the, with the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, where uh, Bangladeshi keys were stolen and they were able to wire out significant amount of funds uh, from the Central Bank in New York through SWIFT. Um, that was an endpoint security issue. The much more complex question is the retail CBDC. Uh, and this is, to Sony's point, multifaceted. Um, you have the question of effectively counterfeiting, right? Can someone replicate uh, the central bank digital currency that's out there in the public and, and create false central bank digital currency? That's terrifying and something that every central banker needs to make sure is as hard to occur before they launch their GPCBDC. But then also the security of the participants, right? Uh, if you can't guarantee that the users have sufficient cybersecurity and, and privacy security, uh, for the use of your central bank digital currency on the retail side, then you're in trouble. Uh, because people have, at least, um, and obviously this depends country by country, but uh, at least here in the United States, there is some expectation of privacy uh, with the balancing of AML and financial crime measures. I think so one, one thing, thing I that. Wanted to Oops, sorry. Go um, sorry, go ahead. But I think one thing that you, know, you also have to think about is, is again, endpoint to endpoint, right? You know, for most persons, were our country to launch a uh, GPCBC, it's probably mostly gonna be used in your phone, right? So first off, you have a phone, which is a piece of hardware. You have to think about who makes that hardware. Uh, on that hardware, there's likely going to be an application, whether it's through a commercial bank or if a central bank did their own direct to retail CBC, there's an application there. So you have to understand who makes that application, who runs that application. How does that application interface with the hardware, um, whether it's iOS, Android, or another format? Then you have to understand the cell tower, right? The data security of the cell tower that that mobile phone is pinging to. How is that data security structured? Who makes that cell tower? What is the national security interest of the person who makes that cell tower? And then you have to think about the lines that cell tower attaches to uh, and the servers that those lines attach to. These are all end-to-end -end points that uh, any country building a general purpose CBDC needs to think about for the safety of their own users. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is an area that's getting less attention in the GPCBC conversation, but I think is critical to understand if you have an, if, if you're giving an expectation of some form of privacy for your users, how do you ensure that that's kept through the endpoint wherever they travel with the CBC, wherever it's allowed? Um, I'm gonna go back to Sonia. I'm wondering, Sonia, in your research, if you've come across any particular, particularly compelling <clears throat> technological approaches to privacy. Um, we hear a lot about zero knowledge proofs being potentially useful here. I don't know if any central banks are, are experimenting in that area. Um, the European Central Bank came out with a concept called anonymity vouchers. Um, just these are early stage technologies, but um, can you put them into a larger context and sort of like, do they have promise for preserving privacy or should we set our expectations differently? I mean, is privacy doomed? <laughs> That's a great question. I mean, it really depends on who you ask. If you ask me personally, I would I would claim privacy is dead, uh, but that's just my personal opinion. Uh, I think we are facing um, a situation where we need to be very smart about how we balance um, financial compliance with the financial integrity standards like AML, CET, and know your customer requirements with the right to uh, a user's privacy being protected, right? So that's basically the overall overarching context that we're looking at. Yes, on the one side, we have like the need to comply with these standards that are typically set by global standard setting bodies like uh, the FATF. And then we have all the users that are 
you know, legitimately in privacy advocates that are legitimately concerned about their personal data, their identity data, potentially being exposed or um, misused in any any form of way uh, through a um, in the central bank or a currency setting. And interestingly enough, there's also these people that will tell you, well, you know, I don't wouldn't want my government or my central bank to have all this information about me because if I live in a rogue regime, this data, uh, the transactional data they generate might be used in some form of sanctioning measure against me. You know, like this is something that I've heard um, at the last uh, Crypto Economic System Summit uh, in October, which was quite an interesting view, right? Because we potentially don't think about it as much, but um, that's something to keep in mind. And in terms of like uh, technological solutions to the, uh, to this, you know, striking the right balance between the compliance and the financial integrity and privacy protection. I don't necessarily, I'm not entirely sure that this is just a problem that technology alone can solve. Like, look, you can have system inherent and then design like uh, privacy into, into the product, into the CBDC, just like you, do, you could do with security, right? The assumption is that you would design a product, uh, including a digital currency that has uh, privacy protection built into the design. But as we generate data through the usagers that central bank digital currency, that data can be used to build a profile around like who we are, even without having necessarily our identity available, right? Like I use my CBDC to, I don't know, commute to work or pay for lunch at work or what have you. And then somebody can really, I mean, at this day and age, it's very easy to construct a profile using that metadata, the transactional data around the around the user CBDC. In that context, you acknowledge graphs and so on, right? So and you mentioned the anonymity vouchers that the uh, ECB uh, has has looked into. And then um, China, I think the PBOC called it a controllable, pri uh, pri uh, controllable privacy, allowing just um, privacy preserving measures in the second tier of their CBDC which is also an interesting concept, I think. And certainly zero knowledge proof is uh, another important uh, solution to, to for central bank uh, policymakers to look into. And Brazil has actually um, hinted at that in their, uh, in their research, as you see in the context of the SALT project. But I don't think that that area has been fully explored yet by um, central bankers in great detail. Now, again, I don't want to say that, or I can't say that technology alone will be able to solve this problem because I think there's a lot more to it. And we had a long discussion. This is why I love the coming to the MAC. Because <laughs> organically, a couple of us, a lawyer, a technologist, and me, cryptographer, we came together and we started talking about it. And we quickly came to the solution, no matter how privacy preserving uh, your product is that you built, we do think that the you know that you potentially there there's potential for uh, for that to be de-anonymized in the process of of using that CBDC in the economy at large. Do you guys have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I I, I think uh, with regards to the role of privacy, I think there's two key points. I think one is that um, as a central bank, we have to be careful about overstepping what our role is in, with regards to how the government collects information. I, I think there's a much larger and broader policy conversation that has to happen in policy circles, um, in government, that understands what is the role of money, who has remit over the role of money, and, and the role that that money will play in data collection. I, I think there is currently, at least according to my you know, public speeches by both the Fed and Treasury, that there is going to be an appetite, uh, and it's gonna be fairly, um, uncompromising that some form of information must be collectible by certain government authorities for the purposes of anti-money laundering, counterterrorism financing. That, that seems to be a consensus currently. However, I think there is also a very strong consensus that this must happen with a certain amount of due process um, because the American public expects due process for, the, for their data collection. And I think that's the government side. For the purposes of the private sector or whatever role the private sector might play here, I think there is also a, there is a very important conversation needs to happen regarding the monetization of data 
and, and, and how can a government entity, meaning the dollar itself, be, can it be or should it be used for, the monet for, a, mo for a private sector group to monetize and to drive revenue? And I think that's something policymakers are also going to take a very close look at um, so that any user of a GPCBC, if a country makes one, knows exactly what's happening to their data, uh, the role the government will be playing with that data and the role the private sector will be playing with that data. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that last point of Bob's is incredibly important. I think that um, <clears throat> when people talk about central bank digital currency and privacy, they tend to think about it as the relationship between the state and the citizen, which is important and should be properly um, thought through. And I do think it is possible to build a system that is private, but also has these, you know, can sort of fulfill these other uh, public policy goals around law enforcement. Um, but I think the bit that is often missed is, okay, who's going to be providing the wallets and what are they going to be doing? because I think that um, any regulation around wallet providers is gonna have to be pretty strong on privacy because I think that in the last 25 years of the internet, uh, a, a culture has grown up that the default is to not have privacy. And I think this goes to Sonia's point at the start about privacy being dead. I think that it's actually, in this case, it's been um, corporations that have eroded people's privacy. And I think that's something that needs to be pushed back on strongly and I think uh, an important part of regulating this will be a strong privacy framework. I just want to follow up on something with Bob. Um, Chairman Powell recently took this topic on, topic of privacy on in, in a congressional hearing and basically said that an, a ledger where the government can see everyone's transactions is not going to fly in the United States. Um, others have been mentioning the Fourth Amendment in this context and sort of the constitutional grounds for for preventing the, the government from using, from spying on this data. I wonder if you could sort of put that into context or, or sort of fill us in on what's, what's going on there. Yeah, uh, so um, Chairman Powell is uh, my boss's 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 <laughs> boss's <laughs> boss. So he's absolutely accurate in everything he says and I disagree with him. <laughs> um, but I, I, think, I think there's a really interesting nuance that, he's, he's, that you're talking about and he's getting to which is we have a funny combination of laws overlapping. Um, I'm a regulatory lawyer by training. Um, so what Mike is referring to is effectively a legal search and seizure of, of your records without due process. And that's something that Americans are guaranteed in the Constitution. Um, on the flip side of that, there is uh, the Bank Secrecy Act, which enables, um, which actually requires financial institutions to take a certain amount of information from you for every transaction. And that due process is effectively not uh, is written out of law there, um, that your financial transactions are not subject to due process if the financial institution is looking at them. Um, so that actually goes to a great question of design, right? So if the, if the central bank were to create a, I'm gonna, I shouldn't go this far off the rails, but um, it's, yeah, there's a lot of people that are concerned that if, if this goes through the central bank itself, right? if, if you create something that was a direct claim against the central bank, it would not be necessarily subject to that. There, would not be, there wouldn't be a financial institution involved. So that data collection would be sub, could directly be subject to due process and would make privacy folks a lot more happy. Um, but if you run this as an indirect claim through the commercial banks, then you'd be, again, going through the BSA where all that transactional activity would have to be covered under the Bank Secrecy Act. Um, I think the end point is, is that there's a lot of very smart people thinking about this from multiple angles. And the most important Thing we can do, what any central bank is doing, is trying to get the smartest people in the room to think about all these consequences. Uh, I, I think there is something culturally sticky about cash. People like cash. Um, and there's brilliant people out there who are very against cash, and there's brilliant people out there who are very for cash, but there's some appetite for cash out there, and I don't see it going away anytime soon. Um, and I think that how we find that middle ground is going to be a long and hard conversation. And I think oh, we have to keep having conversations with people like the people in this room to understand what are the pros and cons and what brings the best final product to the public if we ever go down that path. Cool. I think we have a couple minutes for, for questions if people want to line up at the microphone. Um, there's a lot going on. I'm heavily involved myself in the use of blockchains for identity management. And the initial customers for that turn out to be government uh, because they have a captive audience, not for any other particular reason. Uh, the question for you is, can we separate out the 
currency uses of, you know, that we're talking about from the identity uses in terms of policy, in terms of how this develops uh, around the world, not just in the U.S. Or because I, I don't think we're doing that now. I think we have identity and homeland security type uh, focus, and then we have the topics that we've been talking about today. Can they be separated, or do we need a different framework? I, I can try that. First, you know, I want to make sure that before the end of this discussion, I can say I want to make sure everyone knows this is my own words and not the words or policy of the Federal Reserve Board or system or the bank. Um, technically, yes, they can be separated. I think there is uh, the Bank of International Settlements came out with a paper this week or last week on that that was fantastic. That if you're not reading what the BIS is putting out, it's great work. And you can have a bearer like central bank digital currency that, with wallets that are run by financial institutions. So your PII could be the same structure as now, right, through your bank. Um, but the coin itself is a bearer instrument that can move through the banks. That is very technically possible right now. From the policy side, I I'm not sure where most central banks are going to end up. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think they're separable. Um, but I do think the central bank has to think about how identity works, because it comes back to this protection of privacy of the end users, which is very important. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree it should be separated. In fact, I also think it should be completely stripped from any metadata that is produced. Um, I don't know that anyone wants to sit on a honeypot pot of identity data. That is like, okay, there's a, a huge reputational risk if something happens to that data and it gets leaked or misused, and I don't, I don't think that any central bank would want to bear that risk in, in that form unless you know there's a robust risk management framework around it. I do think that like at some point we need to have like a, there has to be a data governance framework in place that really um, spells out like who owns what part of data. And it, what is the rights? Uh, what are the roles and responsibility of each of the, each of these owners uh, of that data in the process? Like, what are the re resolution mechanism in something in some in instances where something goes wrong? So I think that part hasn't been fully fleshed out yet, and I will. I, I think that we'll we will see that in the in the near term, more uh, sort of um, a better sense of like what and how data is governed, especially if in the hands of public institutions and in, you know, where they can potentially be um, misused against their citizens in case there's a, a drug regime that like, employs sanctuary measures against the citizens. Hello. Uh, have you entertained the possibility of Bitcoin outcompeting fiat currencies? And how do people in your field feel about this? Yeah, yeah. yeah, the idea is very entertaining. Uh. <laughs> so uh, I actually, with some colleagues of mine, we wrote an article about this in 2014, so which you're welcome to go to the Bank of England website and read it. But uh, yeah, I think it's going to be difficult just because, um, you know, we, we've gone over the sort of economic incentives in Bitcoin. I mean, Bitcoin's designed to be very hard money in terms of its monetary policy. Um, that being the case, it's almost designed for people to hold it, not spend it economically. Um, uh, so I think, you know, the history has shown, I mean, we've got 10 years now of Bitcoin being in existence and it has not yet displaced any currency in any country. Um, but which is not to, I mean, it, like, I don't think that's a necessarily a problem for Bitcoin. It, if Bitcoin is some digital version of gold, then it's succeeded on that level. But I think if you want um, a currency to be spent, it has to have a relatively stable value, and Bitcoin doesn't have that, so it's going to find it, find it challenging. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I jested that it's an entertaining idea, but uh, I think the most important thing is that, and I think governments need to do a better job of this generally, is um, celebrating the innovation that happened through BTC, right? And this, this, this event's a, a mark of that, right? It has stayed. It has grown, right? It has grown significantly. It's about 170 billion right now. Um, and a lot of very smart people who shunned it have come around and say there's some really important principles based into that idea. Uh, and that we have a lot to learn from it. Um, as BTC and other, and other crypto, cryptocurrencies or blockchains. And I think we're going to keep learning from it as it continues to mature. Yeah, just, just one final so point. 
Sorry, Sonia, go ahead. Oh, no problem. I just wanted to say that um, as I agree with Rob, um, I think that the basic functions of money are, are not entirely given for um, crypto assets. And uh, that is fine. I'm, a, I'm personally a big believer in competition. I think people should have a choice. They should be able to choose like what type of uh, asset they want to use. And uh, I do think that there's um, a healthy conversation uh, where a healthy, we can have a healthy ecosystem where crypto assets or digital assets in, in general have some way or form to compete and be used in, in different payment systems. I think that's important to start thinking in terms of less of like, oh, are we competing against another, but more like, how can we interoperate? What are the, what are, what are the, what is the broader ecosystem that we're looking at? Is that something that that is potentially viable in the future, as opposed to just uh, looking at the assets individually? I think that we should start thinking about like um, a tokenized economy, potential ecosystems, and the interactions between these digital assets in that context. So I just wanted to make a quick point at the end. Like Bitcoin has been hugely influential without breaking out as something that has displaced any national currency. And I think that that's an important thing to say. I don't take my answer as it hasn't been important. It's been incredibly important, incredibly influential. It's sort of like, I mean, Steph Curry came back the other day and you see when he plays, like they talk about his gravity on the court. So he doesn't even have to touch the ball to affect the game. And I think Bitcoin sort of like that. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to like touch the ball for its gravity to affect the rest of the system. And I think that's how it's been influential. Um, so I think the fact people who say, well, nobody uses Bitcoin. It's sort of a silly criticism, you know, in a way. I think one other thing that, you know, in policy circles is critically important um, is that BTC, for the first time ever, really enabled value to be transferred over open loop internet protocols, right? And that, that was really the game changer in my mind, right? Is that for the first time ever, you didn't have to go through closed loop protocols for value to be moved. Um, and that really made policy, policymakers were kind of in a very protective cave before BTC of at some point for value to move, it has to touch one of these, one of these regulated intermediaries. And BTC blew that wide open. Um, and that really changes the game for a number of reasons from policy standpoints. And accepting what that future looks like where there will always be a value method over open internet protocols is really, really interesting. And unless you wanna close the internet down, you really can't close down value, um, that kind of value structure. And that's gonna be something that's going to forever kind of influence not only how governments handle value, but how governments handle national security, how governments handle data. It's gonna be really, really interesting. Not, it's been an interesting 10 years, but it's gonna be another, it's gonna be really interesting next 25. Um, Chris, in the context of the current Fed interest rate cut, are there capacities or levers that central banks will be able to use at their disposal for monetary policy or other things? Um, in the future, as you imagine it, you know, because you have new capacities as a result of using a digital currency versus traditional? The, the answer is yes. Um, now, that's, this is nothing that we're looking into. Um, but a lot of brilliant people at places like MIT have written extensively on this, which is the idea that um, were a government to entirely get rid of cash, you would get rid of something called the negative lower bound question, which is there's a limit to how negative you can make commercial bank money interest rates because at some point retail customers or entities can go into cash, which is not interest bearing by, by nature. Um, so if you got rid of cash, you could do that. Um, also, central banks could theoretically, if they chose to, create negative interest rates into the central bank. Now, I can't imagine, you know, people struggle enough with taxes and inflation, I can't imagine the public policy issues of if you had a bank account at the Ricks Bank, for example, or whomever, and the Central Bank of MIT, and all of a sudden your account went from one to 90 cents, right? That would be really upsetting to folks. And I, don't, I, don't, I think that's a very long policy pathway. But as we're in an academic setting, absolutely the technology's there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it can, like potentially. I think it's, you know, Central Bank dig digital currency gives you a lot of options, right? You don't have to do everything that it enables, but you can if you want to. And I think monetary policy is a really interesting area um, do we have any Andrew Yang fans in the audience? Hands up. <laughs> yeah, so universal basic income, um, that's something, because one of the things you think about is money supply, right? How do you create new money, money and put it in the economy? And I think basic income is one way of doing that, because I think he talked about doing it through the tax system, but you could do it through the monetary system as well. Um, so I think that 
it opens up a lot of different policy options. Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, this is music of the future, but um, it will be interesting to see how programmability in terms of the central bank digital currency will pan out exactly. Like when you think about inflation targeting, you could do it a whole lot more tailored to specific regions or specific sectors. You can really uh, track the convergence of um, uh, your real economy towards that um, power that's towards that inflation target that you have. Uh, you could potentially also in the, in the realm of fiscal policy, as you were saying, universal basic basic income, but like all sorts of other cash transfers or conditional sort of transfers can be built into, and that's more the the realm of fiscal policy. But there could be a, a real blend between monetary and fiscal policy that could frankly, and possibly make for a much more efficient tool because we always have this separation between monetary and fiscal policy that exists at the moment. But if you have an instrument that allows you to, to really steer both uh, one tool, I mean, I think that's very powerful, especially when, you, when we think about the whole discussion uh, around do unconventional monetary tools really work? Do they fulfill their function, right? So I, in my mind, like, you know, in later down the line, maybe not in the near term, this will be become an unconventional monetary policy tool, which is kind of cool to just think about, like um, conceptually. Uh, I have another Bitcoin question for the panel. Um, so we, we've already seen a lot of governments internationally, um, the U.S. included, using Bitcoin for its transactional purposes, right? So the U.S. Um, government, for example sees the Silk Road coins and then auction them off, right? They con converted value. Um, and we also see a lot of governments and central banks today storing value in gold. Um, we primarily know that Bitcoin is used as a store of value or as a savings technology. So at what point do central banks and governments around the world start looking at using Bitcoin for that use case? You mean as a sort of composite part of reserves. Yeah, like, or, you, you know, I'm thinking like the Bank of Japan is, is purchasing stocks, for example, so they're holding like stocks as well as gold and their own currency. Like, when is Bitcoin gonna be added to that mix? Uh, I mean, it's, it's not really a decision for central banks. Central banks just manage, so like central banks manage the current, like the, so governments own currencies of other countries, right? So, and then one of the jobs of the central bank is to manage that, mm -hmm. those assets gold, other things. And it's really up to the Treasury Department in any or the, you know, the, let's say Treasury in the UK would decide, right, we want to do this with the gold or whatever. So if, if a Treasury Department decided to do it, the central bank would just have to go and do it. The central bank's just sort of the, you know, they'd have, they have an opinion on it, I guess, but I think it's more of a question for a Treasury Department than for a central bank. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, anything Treasury or central banks do is, often, at least in the U.S., is always guided by law and regulation. So there probably have to be, at least in the U.S. side, some rule writing that says this is now qualified as an asset that they can hold. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that that's, but like I said, I think over the last decade, I guess 11 years now, this technology has never ceased to surprise us, right? And so who knows what the next 10 years look like. Great. Thank you, Bob, Rob, Sonia, and Mike. Thank you, guys.